Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to Michael and Friends. And I'm really, really incredibly happy and proud to welcome uh, Maestro Yannick Neze Segar, who has been a longtime friend of the Lucerne Festival. And um, maybe all of you remember his last performance with Shostakovich Fourth Symphony in the summer 2019 which was just magnificent, um, incredible experience to all of us. And Yannick, you and Lucerne, uh, you go back a long time. Uh, you once told me that you came as a student even uh, to Lucerne yeah. and when you were making your way up to the very, very top in the classical music world. Lucerne, Michael, has been so important in my development. When I look at the at the two summers that I decided with my, you know, pocket money and all that I could assemble to go and attend rehearsals and concerts in Lucerne and see all the orchestras, uh, the best orchestras in the world, the best conductors, the best soloists. I look at those moments as really determining in my, uh, my development or my uh, knowledge of you know, the broad spectrum of what music, the classical and especially the orchestral world had to offer. You know, there so many memories, uh, High Tink with Boston, uh, Claudio, of course, with the Lucerne Festival Orchestra, but also with uh, Berlin Philharmonic. I remember Timir Kanov, I remember Janssons uh, in his Oslo years still. Um, uh, Ricardo Chailly, of course, with Concertgebouw at that time. I remember so many moments uh, Barenboim, uh, too many to name, but uh, all of this to say that to come back uh, in 2019 uh, with the festival orchestra was also a highlight of my life. Of course, I had been visiting uh, with Rotterdam before that and visiting with the Vienna Philharmonica uh, already quite a few years ago. I think it was in 2012. So uh, yes, it's, uh, it's already a long story uh, together. So did you envision yourself being on that stage when you first came to the Lucerne Festival? Was I mean, I was dreaming of it, you know? <laughs> um, and as many things happened in my life, I think I, uh, and I think it's important to mention to the younger generation, you know, I, of course it was a dream, it was not a reality. There's no way that one can say, I'm gonna be there. But because it was a dream, I decided to allow myself to dream and to work for it. So, um, you know, it, it's also the proof that dreams are possible if you put the, 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 the work uh, with this. Absolutely. And that's uh, very much felt in, 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 in your musicianship, also the youth, the permanent youth that is so apparent and that's always looking for more not only to achieve more, but to dream more, to create more. That's a wonderful experience always when uh, witnessing your performances. Well, let's go, let's make a stop here and maybe go back to one year ago in uh, a little more than a year ago when we met in January 2020, the world seemed perfectly fine. Uh, we were planning our projects for Lucerne and uh, full of ideas and, and we, uh, I watched your wonderful performance of Wozzeck at the Metropolitan Opera, which I think is one of the best productions I've ac actually ever seen at the Met. Mm -hmm. And um, next, of course, to the Traviata. But, um, and William mm -hmm. Kentridge, that must have been an incredible collaboration for you. Oh, so inspiring, so inspiring to see the world of this genius of Kentridge. You know, he has his own world is one of those artists where, um, yes, of course, it starts by sketches, but I think the theatrical uh, world is also part of the way he sees his art. And to see it come to life with the work of another genius, which, is, which should always be, by the way, the point of opera is to uh, make great art and the vision of a composer and a librettist, in this case, of the most absolute quality with the piece by Buchner and then of course the music by Berg, but have another genius take on it. It was uh, one of those cases where it felt immediately right with the music of at least what I felt about this music and this tortured um, world, nevertheless, very, very detailed as well. And 
it was great to work with him because like the greatest, he doesn't impose in such a way that is um, um, not respectful of the performers or of the, uh, of the composer's intentions. And therefore, for me, it was easy in a way to make music within this frame with Elsa van den Hever, with Peter Matei and the whole cast. So yes, we all felt at that moment that this was something we were all very proud of on all fronts from the stage and from the pit. And I was still working at the Met very much for another production when the world shut down a few weeks later after we met. Uh, I was working with uh, Piotr Belchawa and Joyce Di Donato uh, doing, preparing an incredible Werther, uh, much more traditional, of course. Uh, so yeah, to me, that means that the last opera I conducted uh, on stage as a performance was really this Wozzeck. So it's great memories. And then after that, you know, soon after, the world came basically to a standstill. All the uh, musical institutions had to close down their performing venues. The Metropolitan Opera closed down completely, which is one cannot imagine. I mean, yeah. unimaginable. And uh, we in Lucerne Festival basically had to cancel the whole season last year. <clears throat> And all your other musical partners in Philadelphia and, Mont and Montreal closed down. What did it mean for you? I, I, I guess one doesn't really realize what is happening um, until a certain time has passed. Well, you're mentioning Philadelphia. Uh, we, the day that it all stopped, we were rehearsing already for a, uh, the beginning of the Beethoven cycle. Mm -hmm. As in many places in the world, Beethoven cycles, you know, 2020 should have been the Beethoven year. So we were starting with the fifth and sixth symphony and we decided to play the concert in front of an empty house uh, by reflex. You know, there was nothing, of course, we saw this a lot afterwards happening, but we just decided to do it because we wanted to stream it and we wanted to kind of say farewell because nobody could know if it would be two weeks, three weeks, or three months, or a year like this, we could not imagine. So uh, that was a groundbreaking moment for us and inspired us to keep the connection with the audience as much as we could during these times. And I'm very proud that there were initiatives early on from the Met, uh, a lot of digital stage presentations with the Philadelphia Orchestra, a lot of digital stage presentation at the Orchestre Metropolitain, but this time, and especially now, has been for me very busy, but also very stressful in terms of wanting to do my best as a musical leader to try and make sure that the musicians, the artists, and the people who also around the musicians, the artisans, uh, are still, we don't disappear with this. You know that, of course, we miss the connection with the audience and we know that we will need, of course, we can never survive in a digital world. Music needs this contact with the people. But in the meantime, the suffering of all the artistic world has been, uh, I was really preoccupied with it and tried to do my best to, to uh, keep this afloat. I know I was admiring you and in all the galas uh, we watched uh, the letter at other institutions, the incredible spirit you projected. And I know how difficult it must be, especially also now at the Met with all these discussions going on. It must be terribly difficult. Let's go into your musical partnerships of whom you had quite a few already. I mean, uh, you built up the Rotterdam Philharmonic to an even greater orchestra. You took over the uh, Orchestra Metropolitan Montreal, which is little known to us here in Europe still, but which you're working very hard for to bring it further. Uh, an, an amazing institution, I must say. And, and then, of course, uh, going to the Philadelphia Orchestra as its new music director and uh, also doing fantastic work there since 2012. And then, of course, also yeah, the Metropolitan Opera since 2018, where you basically had to jump in. Uh, mm -hmm. How would you describe these partnerships? How do they differ from each other? And how can you manage to prevail such an incredible uh, devotion to all these organizations? I think it's in my DNA to be, uh, to like to get really attached to an, uh, an institution. And that's a big part of being of course, a conductor is to be at the 
artistic vision of an institution. And I, I had the chance, because it was in my DNA maybe, I, I had the chance to start this very young. I was still in my studies and I was uh, the artistic director of uh, relatively important amateur choirs here in the city who were presenting very serious concerts and doing great repertoire. And so I was 18 and I was at the helm. I did, you know, I, I had to plan a season. I had to do personnel management. I had to uh, deal with a board of directors so and, and marketing. So I think that it influenced what I became after, you know, and then you m mentioned it, Montreal eventually enlarged to Europe with Rotterdam and eventually to uh, Philadelphia, New York. And uh, none of these institutions started at the same time and none of them are at the same development in their own history and i think that's one of the fascinating things um, as being a music director is that it's very humbling all of these institutions are much greater than we are as conductors and we're just custodians of a great tradition or trying to do our bit to just shift a little bit the angle of the big boat or the big ship so that after a few years we see a big difference and um, I'm conscious now that having especially those three institutions and my under responsibility, I can make choices in repertoire and in uh, ways of presenting the music which can influence uh, in my own way, home, humble way with the teams around me, influence how we, we see music. And that is also why I like to collaborate with you, Michael, and uh, the Dusan Festival, because I think it's a festival that's always at the forefront of um, the evolution of the way of presenting music. Thank you. That's such uh, kind words to us. Uh, we are, of course, also very humble and we admire your work. I mean, I've just, uh, you know, several times I've put myself into your role of uh, being a lone music director of the Met and all the questions and all the daily problems you have to deal with, uh, not to mention what's going on now um, with an institution completely closed and uh, hoping to get back on track by, by the fall. Um, but the daily workload for a music director, for instance, at the Metropolitan Opera is tremendous. Um, uh, with yeah. all the musicians, the orchestra, the choir, the mise-en-scene, the, the stage directors, then the, the management you have to deal with and, and, and solving probably uh, 2,000 problems a day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a safe description. <laughs> um, yeah, I, of course, I feel that at 46, now just turned 46. Um, Congratulations, by the way. I'm, I'm, thank you. Uh, yeah, I got you a very nice uh, message uh, on my birthday, but I, I, and also from uh, the, the whole uh, festival, by the way, that was great to have uh, 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 congratulations from the festival. But yes, I think I'm in my um, prime years to have the energy uh, to, but already the experience, but also the energy to tackle all this. Uh, I don't do this because I'm a workaholic. I do it out of love and sharing of what I can with, you know, the, the, the institutions I, I, I am at the helm. My great treasure is two things, is because I, I can, with all these institutions, spend my life then working with the very best musicians in the world. And that is what uh, motivates me, that is what gives me all the energy that's required in, in order to do all of these tasks. And also, um, of course, I'm surrounded by great teams everywhere. So, you know, I, uh, of course, it's a lot of work, but I'm not the only one. I'm just one in the middle trying to get every part of an institution to dialogue so that we have the common purpose. And yes, I don't deny it's a lot of work, but the reward when I make music and I stand with the baton or without the baton, but on the podium, um, that is when uh, this energy is exchanged and actually becomes uh, rewarding. And this is, also, of course, not to insist too much on this year, but this is what's been difficult for all of us. If we are putting the work as musicians or even as managers, um, if we are putting the work and don't have the reward of the moment where music is made, when it's shared, 
it's very difficult. It feels for all of us that we are running a little bit on empty um, fuel, you know. Uh, but we know now that it's going to, uh, you know, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We know it's going to resume soon. Well, you know, I always feel that next to your great art history, which is obviously phenomenal, and uh, you have this compassion with each musician. When, whenever I see you work with an orchestra and you hear it in the result and that you know really what is going on with everybody and uh, if somebody has a dental problem and, and cannot perform as well or yeah, one really feels that you're always with everybody. This, this feeling of inclusion that you're able to include everybody to give everybody uh, an equal importance in, in such complex uh, you know, institutions as an orchestra. And um, that, that's, it's very fascinating to watch that. And then when I listen to you and the Met Orchestra, for instance, for the first time, I, I hardly couldn't recognize the orchestra because I felt it's been put back to life. It is, I mean, it's always been a great orchestra, and, um, but it has received oxygen again, which was mm -hmm. seemed to be lacking. And uh, this seems to be an incredible um, also talent of yours. Well, thank you for saying this, Michael, because it's, of course, at the heart of my um, philosophy of conducting, too. And I owe this very much to, um, to being close for a few years to Carlo Maria Giulini when he was at the end uh, of his career. And uh, his own philosophy influenced very much mine, which is that at the end of the day, we're there just as another musician serving the others, serving the composer, like every artist on the stage, but also serving um, the other musicians, making their life easier in a way, bringing the best out of the people by being demanding, but by being respectful, by making them comfortable, making them at ease to do, give the best that they can and not being in the way or imposing something more that's going to... Um, obstruct some of the soul of the musician on the stage. So I believe that if each and every one on the stage is giving more than 100%, it's a hundred times more than 100%. Instead of trying to have one unit that's just giving parts so that we have a beautiful, but maybe not as uh, powerful or as uh, emotionally uh, telling, um, that you know so that, that 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 is my philosophy and sometimes it takes more time and sometimes it it, it um, it's not that easy but i think the reward is so much better and this is why partnerships are important you know uh, guest conducting is beautiful i conducted um we I, I kept count and i think i conducted between 85 or 90 different orchestras in my life so that means 90 times 100 people. So this is great, but you can't then uh, establish this rapport uh, that is so good for the music. So this is good. This is why I love to create partnerships. When you're up there on stage and you, you meet a different orchestra than your, you know, your seasonal partners, uh, like Berlin or even Lucerne or Vienna, uh, do you immediately feel a sense of individual identity with these orchestras when you when you get in front of them do you feel it feel them very much as a collect collective organization or you see also the individuals that's a beautiful question and i think uh the latter is more what i feel well but it's connected i think that the identity of a group is very much what the individuals made of you know and uh, are making of and that is part of a tradition let's let's for example take the example of of, of philadelphia um philadelphia has been a turnaround in the years you know very very tightly that uh uh a turn from teacher to student, you know, the students were actually becoming eventually in the orchestra, a little bit like the Vienna Philharmonic for some years. And that has retained a lot of uh, knowledge, even from the times of uh, when Stokowski was conducting and that the orchestra was giving premieres of new works by Ravel, by Sibelius, by Shostakovich. So uh, this is recognizable immediately. And of course, the first impression is collective. 
But then you need, you, you hear how the principal oboe is playing and phrasing and you hear how the strings are doing it and you look at the older players in an ensemble and that tells you as a conductor immediately uh, where the, all of this comes from and that is what I am interested in very much now. It's not, I don't want the orchestras to sound like Yannick, I want myself to and I think all my colleagues we should be even more committed to this to serve or retain or nurture what is uh, the heritage of a certain orchestra. And yes, bringing it further, maybe uh, uh, doing it in a different repertoire or uh, as I did in Philadelphia, it was very much associated with the late Romantic uh, and the Russians. And I tried to say, let's have a Philadelphia sound also in Haydn, also in new music but uh, I don't try to change the Philadelphia sound. And so I think it's the same as a guest conductor. One has to, um, to respect um, and honor this tradition. That doesn't mean you don't say anything. That means that, uh, but, but that means that there's a, a listening aspect from the conductor um, and that is an exchange. It's not only one way uh, from me. I don't want them to execute what I hear. I just want to react also to the offering of the musicians on the stage. Uh, that's very interesting. Briefly going into the program, you're going to conduct in August Bruckner 8 Symphony, a giant also. We're so much looking forward to that. And with the Lucerne Festival Orchestra, not Lucerne Festival Orchestra is a festival orchestra. How does a festival orchestra in principle, does it differ? Um, and uh, where, where do you see the identity there of the Lucerne Festival Orchestra? I think the way it has been, you know, created or at least, you know, the way, uh, you know, I remember it come, going back to when I went to hear Mahler V with Abado and the orchestra, it was striking, and I'm not, of course, the only one to say this, but it was striking how the the total commitment to every individual because they were you know some of them were and are still in an orchestra a different orchestra during the year but also some of them make chamber music are soloists and so the idea of the festival is to get these musical personalities and take strip away any sense of routine or of habit and that's what I like about the, the spirit of a festival orchestra is that everyone uh, is happy to really go back at the roots of why we do this, even in an orchestra, making music uh, without what gets sometimes, unfortunately, in the way, which is a certain, yeah, as I said, routine. So uh, the identity of the orchestra is really this abandon, this commitment. And this is, uh, to me, the condition to the only condition to make music at the highest level is, um, is to be dedicated that these few weeks are the most important in our lives and there's this sense of discovery also to do the things differently. So the identity becomes not rooted necessarily in tradition but of, on discovery. And this is what I uh, really like about the, 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 the festival orchestra. Now, let's remain in the highest levels. Uh, the last time we spoke over the phone, um, two weeks ago, you were in some very, very far mountain place. We could hardly hear you. And then the, the lines kept breaking off. Uh, were you in the Himalayas? Or um, <laughs> you also mountain lovers as, as I am and, and as uh, most Swiss. So, so uh, in Quebec, we don't, our mountains are not so high, but there's a lot of them and they're very, you know, remote um, from any civilization is the Laurentians, the Laurentides uh, in, France, uh, in French, and um, it's the oldest mountain chain in the world. And that's something quite remarkable because it's a different kind of vegetation. And it's relatively easy if you go far enough to feel like you're completely the only one in the world. And so I found with my partner Pierre this 
a tiny house which we rented and unfortunately i decided to still uh, have some meetings uh, work meetings that that week but they mostly all failed because yeah service was not good enough but uh, i was grateful for the time uh, also f speaking to you and thinking well maybe you also are close to mountains in switzerland so it's not the same panorama but uh, still this sense of like you're saying the heights and this beautiful solitude which inspired so many composers and uh, is good for the soul in these challenging times is there to you such an ultimate place uh where you've never been, where you dream to be maybe once in your life, that, uh, but it doesn't seem realistic that you, you might get there. I mean, especially not with your schedule. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have two dreams. For many years, I have a dream to take some time to do a safari in Africa. I really want to meet the animals. I, meet, I need to want to see this, this vegetation. I'm, I'm a great, great feline uh, admire so any kind of feline of uh, I, I would like to see and lions and uh, giraffes but recently i discovered a connection more to the greater north and uh, i would love to at once in my life just experience this extreme cold north pole um, uh, empty and uh, extremely awe-inspiring i'm sure a landscape so that's on my bucket list. Uh, I don't think I'm going to uh, necessarily found an orchestra there, though. I think I'm going to go <laughs> for myself. Yeah, I think that's what we all dream of, these kind of places. For me, it's always been uh, Galapagos, which I yeah. have, Mount Everest, which I will never achieve. I know that already now. <laughs> oh, but uh, never say never, Michael. <laughs> Yannick, thank you so much for your precious time and for joining us in Michael and Friends. Um, I cannot say how much we're looking forward to seeing you this summer. And, and you know, of course, we all be pray it's, it's going to be the way we plan. And, and we have to be, in a certain way, we have to be forceful to get back on stage. At the same time, respect very much, uh, you know, the laws of nature, which yes. are reigning right now our daily lives. And uh, this is a very, very difficult achievement um, to do. And we hope to do the best and um, to really have a fantastic summer festival of which you will be a great part in joining again the Lucerne Festival Orchestra. Uh, Yannick, it's thank a pleasure. You. It's I a pleasure to, to meet you. Thumbs, fingers pressed for you, for, for <laughs> your wonderful organizations you're leading, that you come back to stage soon and uh, you're certainly an incredible human being. Thank you so much and take very good care. Thank you, Michael. I'm looking forward to this summer. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.